Hi guys, this is Al with the Let's Get It podcast. Today I have a very, very, very special guest with me today. Very. Did we, did we very. emphasize that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, I've been thinking about this interview for the last uh, year and a half. Year and a half? We talked about this? A year and a half, but you wanted to do something along these lines and like kind of document what all our thoughts were, right? Because right, you and right. I would, would chop it up over the years. Yeah, so, yeah. And, it's, and sometimes you know, we look at you like, we got to write that down because we don't want to forget that. And then as this, we get, we're getting older, we're like, damn, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we got to do it now. <laughs> we got to do it now. <laughs> right, right. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a process. We've been planning this out for a while. Um, if you guys don't know who this person is, um, anyway, let's get to it. Uh, this is Chef Rodelio Aglobot. I call him Rod, bro, that's my man. Um, but his title is so long. <laughs> it might take me 15 minutes to go through yeah, what his title is. Prince, so what, yeah, so what uh, I'm... <laughs> what else? <laughs> but, what I'm going to do, I'm going to let him introduce himself. <laughs> and then if he misses something, I'll fill in the gaps. Right. So you go ahead and introduce yourself no, to no, everybody. No title. I mean, it's... it's for some all, Rod- Rodelio Aglebot. I mean, right, right. You know, some call me chef if they decide to. And that's a whole other conversation about, you know, be called chef or not. Right. But about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I got the name called the Food Buddha. Mm-hmm. So it's became sort of my moniker in the industry. So some people will call me Buddha, Food Buddha. You know, I go by all the names, you know. Um, but, you know, Rod's is, is, is perfectly fine than anything else, you know. So. Well, I would say, what does this passport say? But <laughs> he's probably on his eighth passport by now. <laughs> When I first met Rod, he was already adding pages to his passport, and this was back in ninety, I'm sorry, uh, two thousand. We back met two thousand. I think we met. I mean, I think we've known, we've known each other since ninety five, bro. Ninety five. Yeah. But when you started traveling, traveling, it was a yeah. You know, I would say. Anyway, he's been adding pages to his passport, so I'm sure. How many passports have you been through so far? Well, you get, the passport lasts ten years, so I just got another, but. But well, how many pages have you added? Because you oh, travel I, I, every I, I, week. I've doubled, I mean. doubled, the, doubled the, triple the book. But that was back where they would give you stamps, right? Right, right. Nowadays, right. they don't care. You know, now there's there's no, like, incentive to carry your passport because you can't, like, brag you got a stamp at each of these places anymore. Right. Now it's just like, pfft, send you right through, you know. Now, before, it was like, you need to go through Europe, you get one in each country. Now, since it's the EU, you don't get them all throughout. Right, So, right. unless you go to other, other countries, you know, where they require a visa and you get a stamp, but... That's how much he travels. Like, I, I show up, they want my passport, my blood type, you know, my mama's name, my fingerprint. Right, right, He right. shows up and is like, yeah, come on, keep it moving, bro. Yeah. So, to show you how much he yeah, travels. Yeah, asking me how my family is. And, yeah. Right. Exactly. Uh, so, tell them your, your, what title would you like to be somewhat categorized as? I can, I, you know what title, I mean, you know, I think over the over years... I think it's probably changed for me. Right. I think when you first started as a, as a cook, you want it. I can't wait to be called a chef. But then you learn what you define what that means to you. Right. And is it is it attainable? Well, I believe it's attainable, but in my eyes, not many people can attain it. Right. Because right. Of, the, of, of because I look at my teachers and what I, what they can do or what they were taught or what the, the skill set that they held. Now the chef, you got kids being called chef. Right. Right. You know, everybody's called a chef, so the, the title of chef has no credibility. And that's probably one of the most disappointing things for me. So I don't really say, well, well Rod, why don't, you, why don't you build it up? Why don't you create your own? I said, you know what? I'm a person, for, I'm a person before I'm a cook, right? At the end of the day. Right, right. And we are. We're cooks before we're chefs. Right. I'll always say that. What do mm-hmm. you do? I'm, like, mm-hmm. I'm a cook first. I'm a chef. So, you know, I think, you know, in, so in regards to the title... It's 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 all different, you know, because I think as years pass on my on my chef code, I I think when I first got my like executive chef, and I, that thing would be like expelled out, right? It wasn't like E X E C period, bro. Right. <laughs> right. 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 It was spelled out, mm-hmm. full name, mm-hmm. you know, and then it would say R A. After a while, right? Because you're like, it's something that you earned, but then again, you need to do, you need to continue to do it to retain, right? You need to retain that. Because you and I always talked about it was like, you know, earning your chef code was a big part of, of you being in our kitchen, and we, we took pride in giving mm-hmm. chef codes out and just titles, and and uh, we help people to a different um, standard, right? Right, right. And um, 
so for me that like the title i mean i i no i don't i don't freak out if somebody doesn't call me chef i don't freak out if but if somebody disrespects the the title or the office of a chef right i will call them out on it right but right other than that i think um you know that that doesn't affect me at all right title wise well he's he's definitely being humble with the title um <clears throat> You know, I, I look at um, Rod beyond a dear friend, but in the industry, we'll look at, we're thinking of a, a chef, consultant, restaurateur, um, amongst other things. And since we're talking about the, the chef category really, really quick, how has the industry changed from when you started back in the 90s to now? What have you seen the transition, whether the, the chefs are no longer in the kitchen, the chefs are more social media base the chefs so more what, what, what well let, let's 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 get down to it, it, it there's a lot more than that but it's let's talk about the 90s and then talk about today okay 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 why it's different mm-hmm. all right i got into cooking because i love love right i'm like i'm 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 a romantic right right so becoming a chef going through apprenticeship going through culinary school Learning how to, you know, learning this art being something being passed down to me, respecting our elders, respecting their teachers, building our way up the ranks, earning that tournant, sous chef. That, I was in love with that, right? Mm-hmm. And I think, mm-hmm. like, think in, and when we started, was really the renaissance. I mean, I think between California cuisine at the end of um, in the 80s, really building and, and sort of like this farm to table really start happening in California. Mm-hmm. You had, you know, you had Stars, Alice Waters, Thomas Keller, Jeremiah Tower. Jeremiah Tower. Mm-hmm. You know, all the godfathers, the pioneers of what today a lot of these young chefs don't know who these people are and they should know. Right. Because these are the people who paved the way. Right. Who built the foundation for farm to table. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so so back then, you know, there was that. There was that dance, right? I think being a, becoming a chef was like the, there was a romance to the dance. And so I think the thing is that I like to share is back then when you got a review, right? And you got yeah. a review from, um, you know, one or four, one of four or five periodicals. It wasn't like everybody had a magazine. It wasn't all these blogs. It was like some respected writers, and they didn't review you until you you were open for thirty days. You remember this? There were rules. Couldn't come in to visit me for thirty days. They did fact check. They would call and say, "Hey, what was in that dish? Where did you know? So where did chef go to school?" And then they would tell you when it's coming out. Right. And there wasn't no preview online. You were gonna find out. You had to find out by getting your ass up early in the morning, going to that corner in the in the I think fog. It was Wednesday, Wednesday. Exactly morning. Wednesday morning. Yeah. You know, make sure you had the whatever three quarters to put in the machine, and then you're basically you know taking five of them <laughs> <laughs> to go into right. a coffee shop and reading it. Mm. You and you and yourself, like you did, and I remember that. Yeah. And then you read it, and you're like, "That's right, that was true," you know. And I remember those the, those those my first few um, um reviews, and I'm like, I agreed with them. Yeah, yeah. Completely. So I started building this relationship with the critics and myself and how I was going to react to that. So that's then, back then. That doesn't exist anymore. But the work ethic was different because we would come in early, work for free. Oh, yeah, you yeah. Know, those come days, in work for right. free, you know, because that's the way you pay your dues. And that's even true. with the reviews, you would know someone that he's reviewing in the restaurant. So you call over that dude. Oh, my God, I'm so sorry. So you had a closer mm-hmm. connection with who was getting reviewed. You did. You probably knew a cook or someone in that restaurant that was getting reviewed most and, of the time. And you never, and yeah, like I said, you had access to these people. Not like cell phone access, but you had access to people. But I go back to what you, what you mentioned about the work ethic was completely different. Right. Because you did. You started, you had a two o'clock shift. You were there at 10. Right. Getting all your meats done. And then you're like, chef, what else can I do? Yeah. What else can I learn? Mm-hmm. You didn't care about money. Right. That's gone. So those are the habits. All that's gone for the wrong reasons, you know. Mm-hmm. And then now, mm-hmm. you know, you don't see that. You right. see, and you see them getting younger, younger. You see them going straight to plating, which they don't even understand the sauces 
right? They don't even have, have probably never made any of the mother sauces, you know. Oh, not anymore right? these days, yeah. Or they can't even do uh, a. Uh, they can't even tell me what the food cost is. Right. And they're out there planting with tweezers and in there, and they're like, and people are taking pictures like, ooh, wow, you know, and they're like, they're doing abstract planting them all. That's what it is now? That's, that, you're, we're all going to hail that. That's what we're going to put up on a pedestal. Right. That's who I want the younger or the other chefs to emulate, that right there. Right, right. right. Well, there's not so many culinary schools anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a few here and there, maybe a few, JC has a few classes here and there, but... Um, the Quote and Blue shut down their operations here. Um, Kitchen Academy shut it down. Um, I think LA, LA Trade Tech, they're still going strong. But even I spoke with the, one of the professors down there, he said they don't even graduate. Because what happens is the students get a part-time job and they mm -hmm. ended up hiring them full time and they don't even finish the program. So for him, it's even hard for them to finish the program. Yeah. Um, which I don't think the student realizes that you should finish a program, whether you get a job or not, because you're just getting in the habit of completing something. Whereas, but for me, I feel by not finishing a program, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna go back and life happens and you can't go back. So why not just sacrifice it there and just go through the program and then do what you gotta do. But I know life happens. Financial obligations, it's expensive to live here. I completely get it. But I just think it, it trickles down to everything else. Yeah. Yeah, but is, is is that what you is is why do I want to become a chef, right? Do you remember this? I'm sitting, I'm, I'm interviewing these young people who come through our kitchens. Right, right. Why do you want to become a chef? And they're like, it's, it's the only thing I ever want to do. You don't understand. You know, my grandma used to cook with me. And I'm like, all right, we have a contract, you and I. Mm -hmm. First contract is I'm your employer. I'll abide by all the laws of employing you. Second contract is here, your soul. I'm going to hold you accountable for this conversation that right. you will do whatever it takes to become a chef. Yeah, do I have permission to hold you accountable? Yes, chef. The moment you hold them accountable, they crumble. Right. 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 So, and then you go back. Well, you do what, because you won't do what you need to do to mm -hmm. become it. Right. You even don't even know what really it is. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. don't get all, take the time to really understand and learn. This is what it takes. Right. Don't make the decision, I'm going to do what I can. Make, make the decision of, I need to learn what it takes. Yeah. I, you said something really crucial, I'm going to do what I can. To me, that's a cop-out. Well, I'm going to do what I can to, to make it to that point. I'm going to do what I can to make sure this is consistent. That, mm -hmm. to me, is it's a no-fly zone. Um, there were times when we've, we've opened a place and you were very adamant about, I only want culinary school students in their senior term that want to work in a restaurant. When you had other people applying. We had a ton of other people, and you were very crystal clear. I only want students working here. Which one was that? Because, <clears throat> because did I did I did I specify that because of the bad results we got from another? We did something else that was the restaurant we did before. Then it was not. We didn't get a good turnout. No, I I think for you, you were really trying to give back. You made it really clear that you didn't fear the culinary school was teaching these young individuals. Mm -hmm. Pretty much how to cook on a line, or let alone their basic knife skills. Was this e cuisine? Yes, you were very yeah, adamant I mean, about. You know what? We got a great, great crew out of that. With with everything you've, I mean, you travel quite a bit. Whether it's um, here, the Bay, in the country, out the country, what are some some loopholes that you see with not only cooks but with owners? Like, let, maybe start with owners first. They have a restaurant. When they call you in, what's what's happening when they call you in? In regards to what? what? Are, are they trying to expand the business? Are things okay. not being... Um, they started off one way and somehow things went left. Are they losing money? Are they, they need to revamp? They need to rebrand? Um, when you get that phone call, I mean, of course it varies right. from place to place. But on average, what do you think when they call you, what, what's happening with them? It's, it's, it's a cry for help, right? It's like, well, I'm sinking. Fix this. How do I fix this? what's wrong with you? We need to find out what's wrong with it first. You know, we're, our sales are going down the tubes. Oh, dude, help yourself. Who's your caterer, man? I love this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you and you sort of like, well, slow down because because the, the root of the problem is never the most obvious, right? Right. It's never like, well, wait, wait, wait. Because it could be the owner themselves as opposed to the problem. Right. 
you know, or they, they, they set us up. We're so busy, we can't make any money. Well, because there's something wrong with this, your, your, your system, you know. Your costs are too high or your food cost isn't right. You spend too much money on labor. There's so many, you have to, you know, it's like a needle on a haystack. You have to go find that reason, you know. So in my career, yeah, you know, consulting, you go and, you know, I think majority of them is, or is sort of, let's change the menu. Right. You know, so how do you know what to pick? Well, you, you choose what they're selling, but you also choose, well, you're a Cuban restaurant, but then you have this schnitzel on here. I mean, does it work? I mean, does it, well, you know, it, be who you're supposed to be, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or don't put pigeonhole yourself and don't claim something. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a lot of things like that with, with owners. They, they, they get too caught up in labels and brands and terms. I think they get caught up in like I have to do this, or they're completely ignorant. You know, oh, I didn't know you could do this. I don't know you could do that. Mm. You know, so I would say majority of the time, if it is the owner's, um, that's always the owner's fault. It's 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 a compilation of a lot of things for the restaurant. They go good or bad, right? But ultimately, it falls on the owner making the decision. You know, I've been an owner many times and I have closed restaurants my own and I've, and I've sucked it up what did I learn from that um, so my own personal mm -hmm. I would say some you, 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 you're you too close to it you can't make the decision you, you have to you have to move, remove yourself you know I can't make that decision I have my partners make that decision I should have changed the product what I wanted didn't make sense you know or um um I should not have opened for lunch. Mm, right, 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 yeah. right. And it depends on what part of the country and, for the most part, the demographics of what you're thinking about opening. Not like a lot. You, you go through all your your homework, right? You do all your research. Is like what 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 could gone, have gone wrong in this restaurant that the cause it to to lose money? You know, it's either your costs are up and like you know, there's people stealing from you. Who are your vendors? Are they charging over you charging? You have waste. You look at you know. Um, labor, basic stuff. You're doing X amount of business. Why do I have eight people in here? You know, just basic questions. You ask yourself, like, okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then just you know, personal preferences. Like, well, why, why are they spending, you know, that on caviar? Why are they doing that? You know, what it's it doesn't make any sense. So, especially when because ego gets into play and people make decisions because you don't want to be embarrassed. It's funny, right? We make decisions so we don't want to be embarrassed. But the ultimate embarrassment is closing. Ooh, that's right. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But we won't close. We'll do everything. We'll fight that to the end. But they'll they'll take all the other embarrassments. I'm like, I, I, it doesn't it doesn't sit with me. Right, right. You need to, you know, be smart business people. Like, cut your ties. Punt when you need to punt. Mm. If 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 if, if you're going upstream, then you know what? There's no way it's going to flip directions. Right. You know, cut your losses now. And I think that, that's where smart business people come into play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are really young in the young and they're like, oh, we need to make it all back, or I don't want to do it because I don't want to fail. Right. Are you, you know? still are you still seeing chefs in the kitchen, or are you just seeing a lot of kitchen managers? Because, I mean, lately I've been seeing a lot of people looking for kitchen managers, meaning come in, do the schedule, do the ordering, you know, make sure the guys have what they want, and then it's well, a lead I mean, line guy. What are, like, what, what would you classify these restaurants to be? Fast casuals? Fast casual. Yeah, that's it, right? So, you know, the, the artisan bistros are becoming obsolete, right? Right. You see these... Um, Kitchen managers because it's it's too it's title. Mm -hmm. They don't gotta pay somebody X amount. They're trying to build a system. <clears throat> you know, they bring on someone like myself or like you to create the system, implement the system and fire the kitchen manager and train the kitchen manager. Mm -hmm. We step away. Kitchen manager handles it from there. You know, and but you're never gonna get the quality that we're that we're used to back in the day. A lot of time people tell me, oh, it's not as good as when you do it. I mean, we've, we've been hearing that. That's right. like a, I can make an album to that. But 
you know, you got to get to a point, as you say, step back, meaning we've always made things idiot proof. At least we mm-hmm. tried to. But you still got to step back and, and sit down with the owner or the manager, whoever's running the operation, and say, look, our main goal is to have a consistent product, whether you come in on a Monday or a Friday night. Sure, on a slow Monday, everything could come out nice. That's the easy part. On Friday and Saturday, when the tickets are off the chain, mm-hmm. let's see where your standards are then. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm just curious with you when, when you sit with owners and sometimes you are you got to be the bearer of bad news and saying, look, well, I think I, I think we, make, we don't make the, you know, great. There's this project out in the Midwest. Perfect example, right? On a on a slow night, they nail it. On a busy night, they don't. And it continually happens. Um, you know what? I take it out of their hands. Don't do the dish. Mm, right. <clears throat> create something else that they're going to be able to execute. Right. And unfortunately, what 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 suffers is creativity, um, but what wins is consistency. Right. And then, so if everybody says, what's the, what's the secret to a successful restaurant? What are they going to tell you? Mm-hmm. Consistency trumps creativity. Right. So, you have to play into that here and there. Um, because you look at this generation, whatever this millennia, whatever, I can't even, don't get me started to what I really want to call them. <laughs> um, they walked into a level of food at such a high quality, right? Mm-hmm. They don't know pre Whole Foods. Right. Okay. They don't know pre, a lot of like pre gluten. Mm. So their their whole life they've been exposed to organic, sustainable, you know, farm raised. So, meaning that that's their standard, and we continue to push that. They don't care. Right. It's their standard. They get that regardless, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when you hear these buzzwords with the concepts and say sustainable, <laughs> they could care less. Right. In fact. And you're buying this stuff because that's what you think they want. They could care less. But they could care less. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So now you look because if they're going to go out and be, you know, like you know, um, um, completely um, health-wise, no, they're not. They're not also not the health. But you know, at the end of the day, you're talking about ten percent of the market is really that health really strict right right like right everybody else is everybody who else who pays your bills is not i think as you market and you attack the the gluten-free the dairy-free the you're you're just hoping to pad your your profits mm-hmm. but focusing on that doesn't necessarily make you profitable right you just want to you're, you help you increase your profits by getting a, a part of that market but you're not going to be completely successful just attacking them no no no. i think it's more work than than profit with right. that um what are your what are your thoughts about the whole tablet thing the door that i mean the social media well, the third party ordering platforms well i think at some point you know why is it why why does the restaurant have to pay the majority mm-hmm. of that service one i don't think that's fair because if my customer decides not to come in they should pay, pay the bulk of it. Mm-hmm. And then, why hasn't a restaurant industry, or a restaurant industry, created a app that's Restaurant Pro versus marketing, and where we can reduce these fees to ten percent in order to pay? I think really, like, if I gave up ten percent of that t- of that my check mm-hmm. to pay for the, the, the what it costs to for the tech and everything like that, and the referral, I'm good with that. Mm-hmm. But to ask for thirty percent, right, right, and you and that's thirty seven percent for me. You're still getting money from the other end. <laughs> yes, for both sides. Exactly. Right, right. Th- that that's something's going to give there in the future. And here here's like my, my big question is, if a restaurant backed app that was a delivery based app. Mm-hmm was created 
that had in mind the more the profitability for the restaurant, what restaurants would not join that app? Yeah. And so if I'm joining this app, and you can only now you oh you want me to you want to deliver? Oh, you got to go to this app because nobody else has it. If you want us, you got to go to this. We, then we have we flip the script. Right. We have the control. All right, because right now it's just like the Yelps of the world, the Grubhubs of the world, they have the control. They mm -hmm. have the leverage. Yep. So I think at some point the restaurant industry needs to get that leverage back. That's when I talk about that. So I don't think it's going away. I think dining is, you look at dining where um, it's, um, I think it's just on a necessity now. I think, I hope in my lifetime, I'm gonna, I have a feeling in my lifetime, I'm going to see a glimpse of the future. What does that mean? The glimpse is like where dining, fine dining, exploratory dining is going to be almost like a, a, a cruise, going on a cruise. It's going to—it's not going to happen all the time. You're going to make a celebration out of it. It's going to be rare. It's going to be for people who can only afford it. Right, right. Because everything else is just falling by the wayside. Everything else you won't be able to afford I mean, it'll be just be so. It'll be it'll be that rare sport. I don't think it'll be something that we can do every day. Um, that's what I believe is going to happen. So with the with, I think tech has helped. But then again, here's the biggest thing. Um, the big there there are bigger social issues that happening in the, in the world. One being depression, mm -hmm. loneliness, and isolation. Right. Tech. Right. Does not help in that department, right? right? Right. So unless we build into the tech, let's say, oh yeah, dine. You know, you can order. You can stay home, and we'll deliver it to you. I had an idea of one of these apps needs to build like eat together. Mm. You don't have anybody with. Why don't you create? You know, an eat together meal. Meet somewhere. Right. Right. You know, don't eat alone. Where can I eat with other people? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, have a social place <clears throat> where they can say, "Hey, you you like Popeyes? I like Popeyes. Let's go and you know." Yeah. Because with the database, they should be able to do that. Right. Right. You know, so those are the things that I hope that it ends up helping out in the future. Because, um, as you know, as cultures, we our identity is sometimes in our food. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the only language we know. It's the first language we know. Right. Um, it makes us feel home. It makes us doesn't feel like we're, we're alone when we talk about our food, you know. And and so that's part of our culture. So looking at moving forward, and there are more and more immigrants, more and more things change. Without food, not to eat, without the, the idea of food and sharing. Mm -hmm. um, but the key is sharing, sitting down and eating. Right. Right. That's the part what's what that these apps are removing is like no one the socialistic part of, of of dining is going away so there's i think people need to be conscious about that well i mean you see starbucks is turning most of their locations into drive throughs <clears throat> mm -hmm. because they don't want people eating at real estate um just sitting there under wi-fi mm -hmm. pretty much not doing anything i mean some of the nicer starbucks you know they have a, a a much nicer setup, but most places are, are leaning more towards drive through. But wouldn't you, pick up wouldn't only. you think that that was the success of Starbucks, though? When people were, people wanted to be where other people were. Right. So when you want my exactly. Starbucks, it was always. Let's like, meet at so Starbucks. Let's meet at Starbucks. Yeah. Yeah. We became a hub now all over the world. Like, you remember when we were in, we were in town, we we're in Bangkok. Right. Let's meet at Starbucks. Right. Exactly. You know, and so it becomes this hub. You know, so and I think that, you know, I think I think obviously I think the drive through piece is just are just more ways to get sales and everything like that. So I don't know. And they want people I think they always want people to hang out. Okay. And I think people attract people. Mm hmm mm hmm And with that, they'll continue to have people come in. Because no one really while you walk through a re empty restaurant, like no one's you know, hey, you get, no, I'm not gonna go in there. But people wanna know, oh, what's going on in there? I'm gonna right. go in there and check it out. Right, right. What do you think about someone <clears throat> starting in the industry? Uh, they had a past career. They're thinking about getting into the hospitality game. Um, what are a few 
little pointers you'll tell them other than not do it but I mean with your experience what would you advise them to do? I think they gotta know their why why they really want to do that right why what are they gonna get out of this they have to understand if there's something that that means the the hospitality industry is gonna give them something that nobody else can give them right you know like for us it's an energy that you cannot like energy of being in a restaurant on a Friday there's there's no substitute for that right you get hooked it's a drug yeah. Like, oh, I want to be on the line. This is this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And nothing can nothing can uh, replace that. Right. You gotta love to work with people for one. Um, you gotta have a patience as, of a saint. You know, but I, I think you and you have to be goal oriented and not um, not so easily uh, uh, made an impression. I'm mean, impression not so impressionable, right? Because. I don't know. It's just that I wouldn't. I wouldn't. It, I wouldn't go in it now. Right. That if I had to say right. that. Right. I would not choose becoming a chef now. <clears throat> for those reasons, I don't know why I would do it. I don't know what the payoff would be. It's not like you know, you know. I've been blessed. You know, been parts of cookbooks. Had my own cooking show. We've done all the TV shows and the, and like, travel the world. I never thought anything that would happen becoming a chef. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But if you know, if if I did it now, I don't know. I just don't know if that's what I would want. You know, because I don't know if there was an appreciation for it. Right. I right. think that's gone. I think you know when we started, there were, uh, people were learning about being a chef, and there's a respect, and mm-hmm, one that mm-hmm. now it's sort of everybody's a chef, like I said. They don't know the difference. Yeah, everybody is a chef. Wow. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, for me, it's... Uh, I'm not really sure where to go with the industry. Part of me always feels like a lot of people would shit, and we talked about this before, instead of building out something, and we call it a turnkey, there's a lot of people that want to retire. Their kids don't want the restaurant or the food establishment anymore. Mm-hmm. It's already there. Just come in, put your energy, put your love, put your spin on it. It's already... Whereas in L.A., a lot of people are just constantly starting from scratch. It's an open canvas. I want to do this, this, this. And there's so many places for lease, for sale, that's just literally closing daily. Yeah. I mean, when I say daily, literally daily. I was going to... A friend of mine told me to go check out um, the spe- a pizza spot in the hood mm-hmm. where I'm at. And we go to see the hours and they're closed. Like, like he, it, it was happened. crazy. Like, literally just happened. There was a burger spot I was dying to go to and I kept putting it off like I always do. Yeah, I'm going to check out this burger spot. Go there, closed. And I'm thinking, okay, it's a weekend. Maybe yeah, I came right. on an off day. It's a Monday. Gone. Completely. I mean, the building's still there. Right, right. So when I say it's happening daily, it's literally happening daily. So I don't know. I think LA may be oversaturated at this point. Mm-hmm. I really feel that. Uh, but at the same time, people are still trying to play their hand on it to some degree. Uh, whether it's a hotel trying to add another food why, venue why, or let's first of why is it why is it that it's food that everybody believes they know what's better than everybody else? Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> right. Right. You know, like everybody thinks, oh, I can get in and it's just food. Oh, my mom cooks this, my mom cooks that. But, oh, our gumbo's going to sell. Our this is going to sell. We're better than anybody else's. Right. And so they'll go, they'll go in the game thinking, oh, this is easy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? I don't know why that is. You know, think, you know so you see people enter the game so freely. There's no barriers of entry. Just you have the money to start. Right. You go and start. Right. Um, yeah. Well, 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 Govin and um, and Ben, they're over in the airport now. I mean, you've seen a lot right, of right, chefs right, making right. transitions into the airport. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, it's 24 hours. It's From what I was told, it's a bitch to get in. I mean, you well, got to get it, your, you it, know. It, but think, once you I get in. I think that's part of brand. It's part of awareness, right? Like, that helps in getting other opportunities. But do you want your staff to deal with an extra 15, 20 minutes of security? Do right. you want your product to go through that much scrutiny? When it comes through, right. you know, what if you don't get something one day? You know, do you want to, you know, have some certain limitations? And I don't know if how much. Some are management deals, remember? Some, some are just here, we're just licensing it out. 
Right. And so how much you may not have the control of it. It's just like at, you know having it in a ballpark, right? So having mm-hmm. so it's it's um, you know are these food halls, right? I think it's, it's more licensing deals as part of brand and outreach and everything like that. I think I don't see it being wrong or or like something that everybody needs to do mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because it's expensive, right? Um, you know, and, and so like, how do you make money? Well, sometimes I make money just because you're using my name, right? Then it's up to them to make money after the operating it, right? Right. So yeah. I don't know. And they'll be like, yeah, go for it. Or you're the operator and you're trying to make money off of it, you know. And then that's that, you know that's you know like they say you're paying the premium, you're paying rent, you're paying all kinds of stuff. Right. Right. So, you know, like right now it's happening like you have ghost kitchens, right? Right. That are all over the country. Mm-hmm. But now you have ghost kitchens actually start up start up by delivery services like DoorDash opened mm-hmm. up the first ghost kitchen, mm-hmm. which I'm a part of. So I've been helping run that thing down in, in, up in Northern California. Um, I think it's a great model, but what is what can we actually pay? You get in for less money, but your your costs are high off the bat. But can you make any money? You know, we had one person running close. Oh wow! You can't you can't make you know? It's it's just like you said, it's just hard to make. So uh, just for the the listeners viewers, um, a ghost kitchen is there's no servers. You pretty much have a commercial kitchen. You produce a particular menu. It, you can only get the food through the app, ordering online, a right. phone call. There's that's you only deal with your phone or tablet or whatever. Pretty much. And yeah. someone in there gets the order. We process it, put it in the bag with your name, number, all that information. A driver shows up, picks it up, and takes it to wherever you're at. Um, I work. I worked in one of those. I think that's the way. The food culture is going. Mm-hmm. Um, you're right. I don't know how much money you can make from that off offhand, um, but I do see the culture going that way. Uh, okay. Okay. Cool. Um, Are we getting out here? Yeah. All right. <laughs> oh no! Are you kidding me? The guy wears shorts and it's all good. We're about to have a, a early dinner. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. I think it makes sense in the fact that if you have a catering company, mm-hmm. it makes sense because not only are you producing for the event, but you're producing for your, I think this person has like six or seven tablets mm-hmm. in there. So it makes sense because you already have the staff already there. Mm-hmm. And the thing with catering is, you know, if you don't have an event, you don't schedule any cooks. Mm-hmm. So at least your cooks are always working, always employed to some degree. Mm-hmm. So you could hold on to a staff right. for the most part. It's just difficult um, to gauge when you first start as things sort of uh, normalize, you know, because you don't know what the. Because um, here's the thing, right? In a in a de- dining rooms, you can control your flow. Somebody walks through, walks by, calls in, so in a, in a reservation, blah blah. So you never feel like you're getting hit, right? With, like at the wrong time. Well, right. you can't control the flow on here. On order order order, uh, it's coming in, right. whether you like it or not. It could be thirty and thirty and thirty minutes. It could be two hundred in an hour, right? Right. right. So, so you have to, you know, um, kind of staff wisely, right? Because that's all you got. Is there a particular menu, or do you pick many different items from different restaurants or? Um, here's here's right? interesting. So you have, you have you have your own concept and brand, mm-hmm. but what also people are doing because, let's say, I'm I'm in concept A. It's a chicken restaurant, but then I'm noticing like. In the neighborhood, I'm like, no one's doing, no one's doing, um, 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 pulled pork. Mm -hmm. I decide I'm gonna do a little pulled pork sandwich, add that to my menu, or I add it or create a new store and open a new store. It says Paul's pulled pork, pulled pork hoagies. That's it. Mm -hmm. You can do that, and you're just utilizing the same same labor, the same space, the same labor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but then you also don't want to bastardize yourself to it. But one point, like how much how much labor you're going to use. But um, those are the kind of stuff that we're trying to do. Like, or, or, what are people requesting? Where where can I come up with? Like, oh, I want at night somebody wants a fried rice ball. Can we do that? Sure, let's do that and start marketing it that way because people are looking for that type of dish in the area at night. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So there, there are ways to, to manipulate or at, least, or at least create a menu that you can almost sell everything. But you also don't want to. Just, you also have to be a brand, though. At some point, right? You can't just say, "Okay, I'm going to do burger, pure pizza, mac and cheese here, blah blah blah." And just hit every right. thing that people want. It's not. Right. That's not going to work either. Right. Right. No. Wow. No, I definitely see the industry going um, in that direction for sure. Um, now there's a lot more food apps where a chef can make their own menu, put it up, and then someone can say, "Yes, I want you to come make that at my house." Um, there's still the staffing situation where you can say I'm available for these hours mm -hmm. and employers can come and employ you via app. Um, you know, it's like it's like the Uber of labor, right? Right. Wherever I can make money, I'm going to go and, and these apps are popping up that, to help utilize people to freelance. I think it's a fantastic idea. I wish I would have came up with that, those idea. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think you still have to almost work two jobs as a young chef. Young right. cook to, to make it in this industry, you know. I think a fair thing. I think four to five years in your career. I think it's be fair to say you should at least be a sous chef at that point. Right. You know. I think you got to ride the sous chef thing about two years before you get a shot at like you know maybe chef de cuisine kind of thing. You know. Um, but then sometimes I think all these young chefs they get into a certain point so young. You know, then their food, it's, it's, it's dictatable. Right. If they're going to do this, like, why? It's, this is a tendency. They're going to do this. And um, and then they do it. You're like, well, how would you know? I'm like, because I was 14 once. I know it. <laughs> you know? Right, 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 right. Um, but, you know, for me, it's like I try to do every day what doesn't taint me. You know, like why I still love it. Right. I, you know, I love what I'm doing. So I still get a kick out of it. I still learn every day. But it's also, like you said, it's like it's also being, you get tested, you, know? you get tainted, people, what people are doing. Um, looks good. We're smelling all this stuff. But see, this is, of course, our interview had to be over food, though. It, it wasn't planned this way. No, exactly it wasn't, just, but it had to be over food. <laughs> it just happened to ha happen this way. But I think, um, yeah, but I think going back to that, I think you still got to love food, though. You know, just have an affinity for food and not like just because you, you work where you work and we know all this stuff doesn't mean we become, a, become snobs to, you know, food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that we still eat, I still eat canned goods. I'll throw right. down a, I'll throw, a, I'll throw down a fast food burger once in a while. Right, right. Um, but at the same time, but I also want my, you know, my, my, my fresh farm, you know, herbs and all those stuff I want. Mm-hmm. I love ice cream, so who cares? Right, right. You know, so, but I think that I think I think what you love, you, you know, I I think yesterday or today we went through um, um, pictures of me, me and through my with my cousins, and we started off with um, a simple picture of just me, and I we went to all through all these other pictures. And I was like, I go, I just like that. It was just simple. Mm -hmm. You know, so simple is hard. Simple is hard, man. Yeah, yeah. Simple is simple is hard. You know, like like you know, like having a simple interview with you is hard, right? It's right. not gonna happen. Cause we can talk about anything. I mean, yeah. that was the biggest thing is that I can throw any topic out and we can go ham on it for the next forty five minutes. So that to me was the toughest challenge here. Was like, okay, I finally have this guy for maybe two hours tops before you disappears into this <laughs> <laughs> into oblivion yeah. uh, and what do you talk about so i'm just trying to cover a lot in a short period of time um so what i like to do with people that i talk to i like to do a speed round and a right, speed right. round i just say a word okay and whatever comes to mind you want to speak right, on it right. not speak on it it's completely up to you i've always wanted to do this with the speed round yeah like i never like you know like you know you go to see a psychologist or something like, like word association right <laughs> I never actually got this on, so. Uh huh. Um, <clears throat> okay, you guys ready? All right, let's yeah. do this. Um, small business. Difficult. Relationships. What? <laughs> <laughs> AKA what relationships? We done. Okay. Um, the U.S. market. <sighs> Hopeful. The culinary industry. Oh, 
heartbreaking. <laughs> uh, technology. Uh, the necessary evil. Food of the future. Um. Instant. Yeah. Los Angeles food scene. I hope it always remains true. Yeah. And uh, family meal. Uh, that needs to be brought back, right? That's 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 one of the reasons why things have failed because they took that away. You know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that, that's, family meal means more, reality is, it, it, it means more than anything, I don't think they, they took it too lightly. Right. Just putting up food, but no, it was more than that, right? Yeah. No, we had something to prove when we did family meal, that's how you were, the, sh the chef and the kitchen crew will kind of see what you're all about, they'll say, here's a hotel pan of stuff, you got 45 minutes to feed your, the whole crew, right. so see what you got. So, the downside, if you're good, <laughs> then they have it have you do it every time you oh, come exactly, to work. Exactly. Well, Al's here today. He's doing family meal, and I'm just like, dude, like this is crazy. Um, but on the home front, seeing that both parents usually have to work, mm -hmm. you know, the kids might snack on this. Yeah. So on, on both as on the home front and on a on a restaurant front, uh, it's no longer there. Um, but anyway, I mean, it's it's. I would say my my second chef or first. Giovanni Leone at um, Book of the Giovanni in San Francisco, North Beach. Mm -hmm. You know, it was my, my one of my first jobs, and Italian restaurant. And we're, this was dude, 1992, 93. Mm -hmm. That was a culinary school. Walk into the kitchen, we're composting. We had because he brought all the compost to his farm in Petaluma, and he where he, all the ducks, all the lamb. All the all the geese, all the vegetables, all the rabbits were off off of his land. Oh, so wow. we composted back then, 1992. Huh. And I remember herbs. We would, we would pick herbs, and all the herbs were pristine. Everything was off of his. And the technique was simple, man. It was like saute pan, a little bit of olive oil, medium no medium heat. We have season our protein, whatever it may be. Fresh herbs in the oil, mm. psh, out. Meat, see so it doesn't burn. Yes. Yep. And that's how I was taught to cook that way, right? And then the term from the tiramisu, but the thing was at five thirty every day, it's family meal. And you'd have, like you said, you'd have a couple teams doing it. And five thirty, everybody sat down, had their own chair, long table, wine was coming out. Wow. Wine was out. Family meal. Family huh? meal. We had a half hour. And those, and, and, and he just, he, he said, of all the things you learned from me, this may be the most important. And you still remember it today, like it was yesterday. Yeah. I was like, you know, and that was the whole thing with, like, from the composting piece to, like, that, that cooking technique that I still remember to the philosophies. And, like, that's again, too. It's like, it was a rod. If someone worked with me, what are they going to learn? I'm not teaching you a recipe. I'm going to teach you how to learn. I'm going to teach you how to work. I'm going to teach you how to, like, it's the same thing. The people that were that taught me taught me a philosophy mm. that I could apply and gain more knowledge from, and that's all I ever hope anybody who would work with me would get. Right. Right. All right. That at least it was that. Like, oh, at least you know, did he walk, walk, but he believed in a certain way, you know, that made me better. That made what I was trying to go through made sense, right? Because. You know, half the time it's like, no, we don't know why we do it, or, or you know, I don't know why I want to cook anymore. Even like today, you know, we're talking to Chef John, he's like, I don't know, man, I don't, I don't want it anymore. I'm going to go through that. <clears throat> uh, okay, so what I'm going to do, because uh, dinner's ready, right. um, I'm going to say goodbye, uh, you know, definitely like the video, share the video. Oh, we're taking a break. What, what we're going to do, huh? Yeah, we're just, we're just going to have a meal break. It's like, I feel like you and I need to check in every quarter. I was saying, ask him, ask him what I said, dude, when Rod comes to town, we got to get to the point where if I got to meet him at LAX, even on, even, no, even, meet even on LAX. the phone, <clears throat> mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I think we should be on the phone and say, hey, hey, 
let's let's just tackle three social slash hospitality issues every month. Okay. And let's talk about them. Okay. All right. I guess it's time to eat. All yeah, right, guys. Some uh, you want to uh, give your contact information to these guys? Oh. My no. contact information? No. no. <laughs> if you no, don't know, I mean, you just got to look them up. If you type in his name, this Google will give you like 18 pages. So if no, you no, can't no, find no. him, it's like a- 50, bro. I mean, but that's in English. <laughs> <laughs> you find me, let's go social media, like, easiest way, right? Instagram, the at the food Buddha, B U D D H A. You know, uh, you know, I haven't been a big social media person, but people reach out to me. I'm, I'm more like, I'd rather be there informative and like help versus trying to promote something. Of course, of course, of course. You know, that's kind of been my thing. Um, you know, so they can definitely reach out to me that way. You know, but you know, email me wise, I'm mean, just start there. It's the easiest way. Yeah, the Instagram. Yeah. No, everybody we talk to on this show, they're actually working in the business. I always say reach out to, um, reach out to the individuals that I talk to, the professionals that I talk to, to really get them to work. Like we're we're here to work, we're here to make it happen. It's not just all talk and all fluff. Um, but anyway, guys, uh, we're gonna do some some. Eating. That's the one good thing about this this gig. There's always food. <laughs> all right, guys, take care. <laughs>